Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time. And we thank you that we have the chance, the opportunity to be in your house and to worship and hear your word. And God, we pray that this morning that you would speak to us, that, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds and that you would change us, that we would, we, we would act more like you, we would think more like you, we would speak more like you, that, that the people who are around us would look at us and see Jesus by the way we live and the way we speak. Lord, but especially this week, uh, we pray that uh, we would do that in our marriages, in our relationships. And so, Lord, speak to us today to, to show us how to do that. We thank you so much, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Chad Merle. You may know me as the OC. I have been gone for six weeks. I did a mission trip to Albania. I did a youth camp, and then this church blessed me with a three-week sabbatical where I got to go on vacation, spend time with my family, and I want to thank you. It has been an amazing six weeks, uh, but some of you may never have seen my face because I've been gone so much, so here I am. I'm back. Thank you. Um, I am very, very excited because this week I get to introduce our new series. We're starting a new message uh, series on marriage called For Better or For Worse, and so uh, we get to introduce this, but we're going to do something a little different. We're going to have uh, videos each week of some of our pastors and ministers to give you a glimpse, a look into uh, our relationships, our own marriages. And so enjoy this one. Situations with in-laws. Hey, hey. <laughs> Go back and forth. Hi, we're Chad and Meralda Garrison, and we've been married for 31 years. I think one thing that makes our marriage successful is just our commitment. We went into our relationship knowing that it was for life, and that divorce was not an option. And by saying it's not an, an option for divorce, it meant, what she means is she was going to kill me if, uh, if I left. <laughs> no. I think the other thing that has really uh, made our marriage work is that we're very intentional about communication. The communication has has helped us through the tough times because uh, whether she's mad at me or, or not, uh, we still talk. Uh, you know, at least every week, uh, once a week, uh, I'm going to take Merle to lunch. We're going to spend that time talking and communicating. We just make sure that we're on the same page uh, and knowing how each other's feeling and taking care of those conflicts the moment they happen. I think that we have a lot of conflict. Um, I mean, obviously we have our issues. Um, kids and the discipline of that. And sex. Differences with in-laws and, you know, extended family. And sex. Money sometimes. And sex. Yeah, and sex sometimes. You know, I think with when it comes to conflict, we're both passionate about our ideas. We both are always right. And yet we both care more about the marriage than about uh, winning the argument. Uh, but we are such different people. It took me a long time to figure out how different we were and how we resolve conflict. Yeah, Chad's the type. He wants to resolve it right away. You know, let's talk about it. Let's, let's you know, resolve things and move on and, and all's good. But I'm not that way. He had to learn, and I think he's done a great job, that I have to process. I have to go through the emotions. Sometimes I have to get mad. and then Tears. Lots of tears. Tears sometimes, because sometimes there's just no other emotion. But I've got to work through that and then get to that point where I can come back and say, okay, now I'm ready to talk about it. But that, that took some time. And, and it helps to remember that Love is patient and love is kind. I think one thing is to constantly reevaluate what your relationship is and to reinvent your marriage. You know, when kids come along, that changes the whole dynamic. So you've got to look at, you know, how you're going to spend your time together, when you're going to spend your time together. Uh, you know, we're in the stage now where we're basically empty nesters and we're still reinventing after 31 years. Um, so 
I think that's a huge key is to keep, don't be stagnant and just keep, keep things changing. Yeah. You have to invest in your relationship with your spouse. Uh, I know you love your kids, take care of your kids. I know you're invested in the job, but, but invest in the marriage. Uh, make sure that you're having fun, that you're taking care of the relationship, you're listening to each other. Uh, the other thing I want every uh, husband to know is this. Uh, the Bible tells us that the man who loves his wife loves himself. So guys, if you want a great marriage, you got to figure out how to bless your wife. And, uh, and especially at that point of just how you love her. Um, so I want to challenge you guys, look at your wife and realize that God calls you to love her as she is, not as you wish she was. And if you'll ask God to help you do that, he'll give you the power to love your wife and value her uh, and enjoy her as the partner that you chose to marry and, and realize that she is a blessing and a gift from God. And the more that you can bless her, then the more your life is going to be blessed and the happier you're going to be and the stronger your marriage is going to be. So that's our lead pastor, Chad. I wonder what's on his mind. <laughs> now, I, I'm very excited about this series. We're going to spend the entire month of August talking about relationships and the different facets and com uh, complexities that come along with marriage and relationships. Um, but we're going to do something a little different with the end of this series. The last weekend in August, we're actually going to have a panel up here on the stage of some of our pastors and leaders. And we're going to answer your questions. And so here's what we ask you to do. The instructions are in your bulletin. But we ask you, if you've got questions about marriage and relationships that we haven't addressed uh, on any of the weekends leading up to that, um, send us those questions by email, uh, and we will do our best to address them from the stage uh, that last weekend. If you've been at Calvary more than six months, you know that any time we get all our pastors on stage, it's an adventure. So don't miss the last weekend of August. Don't miss any of this month of August because you'll love it. So take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Now as you're turning there, this is the marriage series. So let me tell you a love story. Let me tell you my love story. I was 21 years old. I was in college, in a small college in the Texas Panhandle. Um, one Thursday night, uh, I went to a worship service that was being offered on my campus. It was every Thursday uh, that they offered this. And so I went one Thursday night, um, got there, had an amazing experience with God. It was a wonderful time. And then afterwards, uh, me and a bunch of my friends were hanging out, trying to figure out what we were going to do with the rest of our evening. I mean, it was only 11 o'clock at night, so we still had like five hours left. So we were talking and chit-chatting, and I look over, and there she was. Five foot four, brown hair, drop dead gorgeous. And she had a friend with her that I knew. Her friend's name was Janet, and so I walked over to Janet, and I was like, dude, Janet, who's the girl with you? Because she is hot. And Janet goes, she's 15. And I went, okay, whoa. <laughs> yeah, in Texas, you go to jail for that kind of thing. So I, I was, okay, clearly that's not part of God's plan. I'm just going to step away from that. But we actually struck up a friendship. She actually went to this Thursday night worship uh, service on a regular basis. And so we had mutual friends, and we hung out, and we, we became friends. Fast forward five years. I'm 26. She's now 20. And one afternoon, I had to go to the mall. And I say, I had to go to the mall because I'm not a big mall person. Uh, I'm one of those guys that I know what I want, and so I walk in, go to the store, grab it, pay for it, walk out. That's, that's how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was going to the mall in Amarillo to exchange some snowboarding pants because I'm cool like that. And um, I went in, I exchanged my pants, I come back out, and I'm walking down uh, the walkways in the mall, and there she was, and I saw her, and everything around me stopped. People were in mid-stride, and they paused. <laughs> a, a Barry White song came on in the background. You know, the, the one that starts out, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it started playing, 
And she moved in slow motion. It was like, I wish. <laughs> no, but I did see her. And I looked at her and I went, oh, there's Jana. And I thought, she's gorgeous. And so I walked up and I started up a conversation. She worked at one of those little aqua massage booths in the middle of the mall. You know, the, you lay down and they close the door over you and it beats you with water. Anyways, she worked in that. And so I sat down. I started talking to her. I spent an hour and a half talking to her. And then found myself looking for excuses to go to the mall. I went to the mall that next month and a half more than I had gone the five years prior combined. And it was because I wanted to go spend some time with Jana. And so I, I would go and I'd spend a couple of hours talking to her and hanging out. And, and one afternoon I had been visiting her and I'm getting ready to go and leave. And I said, hey, I'll give you a call sometime. She goes, no, you won't. And I went, ow. I thought we had a spark. I thought there was a connection. It's like she kicked me in the gut. But she, she looked at me and she goes, you don't have my phone number. And I went, oh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, if you haven't gathered so far. And so she writes her number down and gives it to me. A couple weeks later, I call her up. I said, hey, I'm a youth minister, and my high school boys have made regionals in basketball, and I want to go to this game. Would you, would you like to go? And she goes, I'd love to go. Pick me up in 15 minutes. So I got cleaned up. I <laughs> headed to her house, picked her up. We drove 45 minutes to Tulia, Texas, to watch a boys basketball game, had a great time, drove back, and I spent like an hour and a half talking to her in my truck right after we got back to her parents' house. And from that point on, I called her every night. I fell deeply in love with her. Um, we, I've known her for 17 years. We've been married just over 11. We have a five-year-old son, Knox. I'm blessed I'm not going to lie to you. I've got it good. My wife is amazing. My son is awesome. But it's because we've been intentional about that. There was a time when I was in college, and I was starting to think, uh, okay, I'm in my 20s. Maybe I should start thinking about marriage. And one of the thoughts that came to my mind was, okay, I'm thinking about marriage as a possibility for my future, but how do two people who are very different Commit and stay together for a lifetime. Have you ever thought that? Some of you are probably sitting in these pews next to your spouse going, I'm wondering that right now. <laughs> You're praying to God saying, how do you expect me to stay with this person for the rest of my life? But luckily for us, if you've ever had that thought or maybe you'll have it in the future, the Bible talks about this very subject in Genesis chapter 2. So look at Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 18. And it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now stop there. Because this is kind of a big deal. Because up until this point, Adam's been without a mate without a female or even another guy. He hasn't had a companion. And so God recognizes pretty early on that we as men need helpers. We as men need partners, companions. And women, let's face it, you need partners and companions and helpers, don't you? Most of us in this room are wired by God to be in a relationship. And I say the word most because many of you in this room are single, and that's okay. Let me dispel a big myth right now. There is nothing wrong with being single. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7, and he says, it's good if you can remain single because then your time and your attention are not divided between a spouse and God, but you can dedicate all of your time to God. If you are single in this room, and you don't have plans to get married, or maybe there's no prospects right now, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. God says that is great. Focus on your relationship with the Lord and do so. And you, if you're single in this room right now, you're thinking, great, the entire month of August is on something that does not apply to me at all. Let me give you this. First off, maybe you will get married, so take notes. You know, maybe this can help you later on down the road. The second thing is, if you're single right now, 
that's okay. Apply what you learn and hear about being in a marriage relationship. Apply those things to your relationship with him, with the Lord. And so this series is not just for married people. If you're single, you can apply it to your relationship status with the Lord as well. So let's fast forward now to verse 21. Genesis 2, verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now stop there for just a second. Put yourself in Adam's shoes. You go to sleep. It's a particularly deep sleep. And you wake up and God goes, hey, look what I made for you. <laughs> Check this out. Let's see what Adam says in verse 23. He says, then the man said, this at last, right? Adam recognized that he needed a companion. Because up until this point, he's been naming the animals. So an elephant comes by, he goes, oh, that's an elephant. Not for me, though. Horse walks by, that's great, it's a beautiful animal, but not for me. Porcupine, absolutely not for me, but it's going to be called a porcupine. And then God creates a woman, and Adam goes, finally, someone for me, someone to be my companion. And so let's read on, verse 23, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So God's design is for us to hold fast. What does hold fast mean? It simply means that you hold on to something, and you grasp it, and you don't Let go. God's design for marriage is commitment. But here's the catch to commitment. Commitment doesn't just happen, you make it happen. Commitment does not just happen on its own. It's not this miraculous thing that, ah, love, and it it gets you through the entire marriage relationship. No, if you want your relationship And your commitment to stay true, you have to work at it, don't you? Love, the emotion of love, is going to change. It's going to morph. It's going to turn into something that you didn't expect. It's going to be there, but it's going to be different. And so you need to commit. You need to make commitment happen. Jana and I uh, bought a house two years ago. Um, and so we bought the house, we spent a couple of weeks fixing it up and painting some rooms and things like that that needed to be done before we moved in. We moved in, and the second day we lived in this house, it's June two years ago, second day we moved in, the air conditioner goes out. Yeah, most of you are like, June in Havasu, no AC, uh-uh. And that's what we thought. So I got to thinking about it, I was like, okay, what, what can I do? I... I am not an air conditioning technician. I have no idea how to repair this thing, which means I'm going to have to call an expert. And I'm going to have to spend money, and I'm going to have to spend time, and I'm going to have to invest in order to fix this issue, which was kind of a non-negotiable in June in Havasu. And so I debated about what to do, and finally I just grabbed my son, grabbed Knox, And I took my wife by the hand, I took him out to the car, I put Knox in his car seat, I walked back into my house, and I grabbed a match, and I burned that dump to the ground, because I am not going to live in a house with no air conditioner, you better believe me. Now, is that what I did? No. No, I called an expert, and I hired him to come and fix my air conditioner. I'm not going to buy a house and then burn it to the ground, but don't we do that with some of our marriages? We hit the first problem, or we hit the seventh problem, or we hit the 90th problem, and we go, that's it. I'm done. Marriage was supposed to be easy. I wasn't supposed to have to go through this. My spouse was supposed to be perfect and attractive, and that's not happening. And you stand on the sidelines with a matchbox, and you go, you know what? I'm just going to sit here until I'm completely fed up. Mind you, I'm not going to do anything about it, but I'm going to sit here with this match. And when you get tired, 
you, and you walk away. And is that what we're supposed to do with our marriages? Absolutely not. Commitment doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen. And so that's easy to say, but how do we make it happen? I can tell you, okay, thanks for coming. Go make your commitment happen. But if I don't help you with that, it doesn't do you any good. So I'm going to give you two ways to ensure that commitment is happening in your marriage. Here's the first one. The first one is to understand that love leads to commitment. Love leads to commitment. Love is not how many times you say, I love you. It's how many times you prove it. Did you hear that? It's not about how many times you say that phrase. It's how many times you prove that you believe that phrase, I love you. You know, the problem is today is that too many of us believe that love is an emotion, but love, as defined by God's word, is actually an action that has an emotion attached to it. Because let's face it, guys and ladies, if you've been married any amount of time, your love, the emotional side of your love, has changed from the day when you first married your spouse, right? I mean, it changes the moment that you fart in bed and pull the covers over your wife's head. (laughs) It's different from that moment on. It is. We start to get comfortable with one another, and the emotion changes, doesn't it? You're you're putting that picture in your head, aren't you? (laughs) So we have to understand that love is an action It has an emotion attached to it. And we have to dispel this myth that we just fall in and out of love. That we don't choose who we fall in love with. It just kind of happens. Oh, I just fell in love and uh, it just kind of happened to me and I, I had no idea it was coming. But is that really what we believe? Think about this for a second. Let's not not consider God's word for just a moment. Let's just think about this logically. If love is as big of a deal as we make it out to be. Because let's face it, if I was to survey every one of you in this room and I asked you on a scale of one to 10, how important is love to us and our society? Most of you are gonna say somewhere between eight and 10. You're gonna place it as important. If we think that love is that important, do we really think that it happens accidentally or haphazardly? Do we think that something that important just happens? No. For, for me to say that I fell in love with someone accidentally is like saying, oh, I tripped and I fell in a big pile of love and it's all over me now. Yuck. <laughs> or I, I, I fell out of love with someone and, and it just kind of happened and it was an accident. No. You neglected the action of love and the emotional side of it diminished as a result of your neglect. Love is an action. Love is something we do and when we do it, God honors that and gives us an emotion that drives us to do those actions more. He gives us feelings. So what does, how does God define love? Well, let's look in 1 Corinthians 13. It'll be up on the screen. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says this. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Did you catch that last line? If you live out verses 4 through 7, your love will never end because you're putting the work in, because you're making love happen. You're making commitment happen. This is a list of actions. Think of it this way. Instead of saying love is patient and kind, insert your name there. Chad is patient. I was not very patient this week. Oops. Chad is kind. I snapped at my wife two days ago. Maybe I'm not so kind. 
And when you insert your name there, you can have a starting point. You can look at this. Look at this passage. How many of you, how many of us in this room can fulfill this passage perfectly? How many of us are perfectly patient, perfectly kind? No, not a single person. Not me. And so if you insert your name in there, you can begin to see, okay, I haven't been patient with my spouse. That's something I need to start working on. Oh, I was not kind to my spouse two days ago. I need to go apologize and start working on that. It gives us a starting point. So think about living out love. I'd recommend that you take this passage, write it out, type it out, print it out, put it somewhere in your house where you can see it and you can constantly evaluate how you're doing with love. Am I being patient and kind? Am I not boasting? Am I not being rude? Am I not being resentful? Am I, am I being too angry? And evaluate how to be a better spouse. So it gives us a starting point. So commitment doesn't just happen. You make it happen. But then also, we need to understand that we understand love leads to commitment. But the second thing we need to understand is that contentment leads to, leads to commitment. Contentment leads to commitment. And you may look at that statement and go, uh, you got that backwards. Shouldn't it be commitment leads to contentment? Well, yes and no. Let me explain. Proverbs 5.18 says, Rejoice in the wife of your youth. In other words, what this passage is saying is that we need to think and look at our spouse the day we looked and thought about them the day we got married. I don't look at my wife and expect her to be what I thought she would be 11 years ago. I look at my wife as God has made her now and I rejoice in her. You need to look at your spouse through the eyes or the lenses that you looked at them the day you married them. Rejoice in the spouse of your youth. But how do you do that? Well, let me give you some tips. First one, brag on your spouse constantly. When you're around your coworkers, be bragging about how awesome your spouse is. When you're around your family, be talking about how amazing your spouse is. When you're around a complete stranger, pull out a picture and talk about how hot your spouse is. Whatever that looks like, but brag constantly about your spouse. If you don't have anybody to brag to, brag to the dog. <laughs> I don't recommend bragging to cats. They're inherently evil, and so they might try to twist your words and ruin your marriage, but... Brag to the dog, it's a safe place to go to. But brag on your spouse constantly. And here's the flip side of that. Never let someone insult or put down your spouse in your presence. Never allow someone to trash your marriage by the words that they feed you. Don't allow that to happen. The second thing is think about them constantly. You know, when you're driving down the road and you hear a love song on the radio, your spouse should be the person you're picturing in your mind. Whatever that song is saying, your spouse should be the one you're thinking about. When you're at work and you're not doing anything and you're cruising through Facebook, think about your spouse. Daydream a little bit. Now, don't daydream to the point that you risk your job or drive yourself off the road, but daydream a little bit. Think about your spouse. Think the good things. And as you're thinking about your spouse, the next point is to not just think about them, but also think about how you can bless them. Chad mentioned it in his video. Look for ways that you can bless your husband or wife. Or if you're single, how you can bless the Lord. What can I do today that's going to help my spouse? What can I do today that's going to speak love to my spouse? What can I do today that's going to show my spouse how valuable they are to me? What can I do to bless them? And think about those things day in and day out so that you can bless your spouse. And then lastly, don't expose yourself to the temptation of infidelity or adultery. Don't do it. Guys, I'll be honest with you. Some of you in this room have inappropriate relationships with the opposite sex. Some of you are spending way too much time with a co-worker of the opposite sex and there's an emotional attachment beginning there and you need to stop 
You need to put up boundaries on your relationships because the only person that you should have an intimate, emotional attachment to is your spouse. Period. End of story. So stop building these fantasies or these scenarios or these emotional relationships with people that don't deserve that. Your spouse deserves it. And so be cautious. Put boundaries on your relationships to protect your marriage. The second way that we protect ourselves from adultery and infidelity is we need to eliminate pornography in our lives. Men, let me be very blunt with you right now. There is no reason for you to not have accountability software on every device you have that's internet accessible. Period, end of story. Some of you are going, well, you know, I pray and I read my Bible. No, that's an excuse because you're addicted to pornography and you need to get out of it. So stop making excuses. After the sermon's over, go home and download a software. And if you need help with that, come talk to one of us. We will download it for you and then make your wife the accountability partner. There's no reason to have an external affair with a computer when you have a, when you have a wife at home. No reason at all. No excuse, go home and do it. If for no other reason, protect your children or your grandchildren from being able to access that stuff on your computers. Protect the people around you. Women, this is a little different for you. There, according to statistics, around a third of you women in this room struggle with internet pornography. So same thing I told the men. Put accountability software on everything you own, period, end of story. But there's another side to women when it comes to this issue. With women, you build emotional cheating infidelity situations. And so the pornography for you in a lot of ways are romance novels. There are TV shows where you build fantasy scenarios with men who are not your husband. If you're doing those things, you need to get rid of them today. Get lost, get out of the house, get rid of them because you need to only be emotionally attached to your husband, period, end of story. So get rid of any temptation of infidelity or adultery in your life and protect and honor your marriage. The fact is the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it and take care of it. Now I know that's a poor analogy in Havasu, But think about it this way. If you wanted to have some grass, a patch of grass in your yard in Havasu, how much would you have to pay attention to it and take care of it? A lot. Watering it like seven times a day, fertilizing it constantly, making sure it's got the right amount of shade. You should protect your marriage the same way. You should be taking care and nurturing and watering and protecting your marriage relationship with the exact same intensity. The grass is not greener on the other side. It's greener where you protect it and take care of it and water it. So build a fence around it. Don't let the dog pee on it. Don't let anybody trample it down. You protect your marriage at all cost. Take care of your own patch of grass, the grass in your own yard. Stop looking at your neighbors. Commitment doesn't just happen, you make it happen. So here's my question. What do you need to do in order to commit to commitment? What needs to change in your life in order for you to commit to commitment? For some of you, you need to go print off 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 today And you need to read that and apply your name to that passage. And you need to start living out patience and kindness with your spouse and all the other things that it lists. For some of you, you need to start looking at your spouse through the lenses that you looked at them when you first married them. And you need to rejoice in the spouse of your youth. For whatever it is, let us help you. If you need help with this, contact us. But don't let your marriage fall apart. Don't light that match and burn down what you've committed to. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. And we thank you for this opportunity to be here. But Lord, we thank you for marriage. We thank you that you recognize that we need a partner. We need a companion. And Lord, we pray that we would honor that companion, that relationship that you've blessed us with. Help us to commit 
and do whatever it takes. And Lord, help us to not overanalyze what our partner needs to do, but help us to look inside ourselves and look at what we need to do to fix our marriage. So Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we lift all these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship. We're going to teach you.